In this video, we're going to be talking about canine oral melanoma. If you're here because your dog has been given this diagnosis, I'm very sorry. It is okay to be angry. It is okay to be sad. It is okay to feel whatever you're feeling. But knowledge is power. I hope Veterinary Oncology Services is here to provide pet owners all over the world with the information they need to make the best decisions for their family member. Okay, before we dive into oral melanoma, let's talk about what a veterinary medical oncologist is, and then we'll just take a couple of minutes to talk about cancer, and then we'll talk specifically about melanoma. So a veterinary medical oncologist is someone who, well, did a lot of years of training. I got my undergraduate degree at Rowan University in South Jersey, and then four years of veterinary school I got my veterinary degree at Western University of Health Sciences in Pomona, California. Then I did a one-year rotating internship in surgery, internal medicine, and a lot of emergency medicine at Garden State Veterinary Specialist in Tinton Falls, New Jersey. And then I was fortunate enough to be able to do my medical oncology residency at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. During a residency, veterinarians practice under the guidance of experienced board-certified mentors. We teach students. We do research and publish a research project or paper. And we also have to pass multiple rigorous exams. I've now been practicing medical oncology for about 14 years. I've learned a ton during that time and I now want to share that information with anyone who needs it. So in order to understand melanoma, we need just a very basic understanding of cancer. Cancer, put simply, is the overgrowth of one particular cell. The cell that's gone haywire and then starts to divide and divide and divide and grow and grow and grow and then overwhelm a system. A lot of times these cancers or these overgrowths of cells form a tumor, a solid tumor that you can see and measure, and sometimes they are an overgrowth of cells circulating in the bloodstream. So these overgrowths of cells could be the overgrowth of a liver cell and you get liver cancer, or the overgrowth of a brain cell and you get brain cancer, bone cells, you get bone cancer. Melanoma is the overgrowth of a cell called the melanocyte. This cell is mostly in the skin. Sometimes it's also in the mucous membrane. And it's what gives our skin and our hair and our eyes some degree of pigment. Melanocytes produce melanin, and that's where the color comes from. Now, a melanoma of the oral cavity is unfortunately the most common oral tumor that we diagnose in dogs, and it is also very aggressive. By aggressive, I mean it does a lot of damage right where it is. So it can become an ulcerated and painful and infected wound and tumor within the mouth itself. And it can also start destroying the underlying jawbone, which is very painful. Unfortunately, oral melanoma very commonly spreads to another location either the draining lymph nodes, which are usually the mandibular lymph nodes that live here under the jaw, or to the lungs. Sadly, with no treatment, this in most cases happens within about three months. And when that happens, dogs become very sick and very unhappy. They have exercise intolerance, so they don't really wanna do anything, or if they do want to, they can't go for walks, run in the yard, play with their family. A lot of times they don't want to eat, or maybe they are eating, but you can see them getting skinnier and skinnier. And a lot of times families just tell me they can just tell something's wrong with them. And when this happens, most families are rightfully so considering euthanasia. This is all terrible. I'm, I, I really can't sugarcoat this, but I'm about to say something that you're going to think makes me crazy. I absolutely love treating oral melanoma now. This used to be a cancer that, you know, maybe five, seven years ago, I really couldn't do anything about. We would remove them. We do have the melanoma vaccine, which we're gonna, we're gonna talk about all this. But a lot of times I was still seeing short survival times. 
nowadays with the advent of newer treatments, I'm seeing survival times as 12, 18, even 24 months, which is absolutely unheard of and very exciting and very rewarding to see. So how do we go about helping patients with this horrible type of cancer? Well, the first line of defense is surgery, or at least it could be. Unfortunately, a lot of these tumors are all the way in the back of the mouth. And so removing a tumor from the back of the mouth with clean margins is very challenging. So what do I mean by margins? The tumor that you can see and feel, measure and get your hands around, is a lot of times just the tip of the iceberg. A lot of times there are satellite cells around that tumor that if you don't remove, will grow into another tumor. And in the case of oral melanoma, we'll do that pretty quickly. In order to remove any oral tumor, melanoma, soft tissue sarcoma, osteosarcoma, squamous cell carcinoma, with clean margins, a lot of times we have to remove a portion of the jaw. Now on the back of the mouth, even when we do that, a lot of times we're, there's not enough space, there's not enough room to get all of those satellite cells. And so a lot of times we end up with either dirty margins or narrow margins. Now, while clean margins is always what I desire for any tumor type, a lot of times that is not achievable for oral melanoma or any tumor, especially in the back of the mouth. That doesn't mean that we can't continue to try to help that patient. So what do I do after part of the tumor has been removed? I know exactly what it is, but I know some has been left behind, number one. Or number two, even if there was a clean excision for an oral melanoma, we still see metastasis usually within three months of that surgery. So I, whether there was clean margins or not, I still have to follow up with some kind of care to keep that cancer under control. So my first line of defense, well, one line of defense is the melanoma vaccine. This is a treatment vaccine. It's not a preventative vaccine like your dog's rabies vaccine or the Bordetella vaccine or for us, the polio vaccine. We use the word vaccine almost any time we're talking about trying to get the immune system to do something. And so with treatment vaccines, we are trying to get the immune system to see those cancer cells as something foreign or something that needs to be destroyed. A lot of cancers have the ability to hide from the immune system. They kind of have this force field around them that prevents them from being seen by the immune system. And the melanoma vaccine kind of helps shed some light on these tumor cells so the immune system can then see them and go after them. The melanoma vaccine is a transdermal injection that's given with a special injector device once every two weeks for four doses, and then we booster that every six months. Now, I'm a believer in the melanoma vaccine, but just like every other cancer treatment I have, some patients respond and some patients don't. And we don't know ahead of time who's who. So whenever I'm treating any patient with cancer, whether it's melanoma or something else, I like to try to attack it from as many different angles as possible or use as many tools as possible. I mean, everything from surgery to broccoli and everything in between, I'm going to throw at this cancer. Even if I can treat a patient with the melanoma vaccine, I'm also going to want to treat with something referred to as targeted therapy. This is not exactly the same as chemotherapy, even though both of them treat cancer. They're both anti-cancer drugs. Targeted therapy is a bit different than chemotherapy. Chemotherapy goes into the body and kills rapidly dividing cells indiscriminately. So whether you're a tumor cell or a cell that lines the small intestine, if you're turning over all the time then chemotherapy is going to be attracted to that and is going to kill that cell. Targeted therapy, on the other hand, well, targets specific mutations in the cancer or mutations in the cell 
cause that cell to overproduce a particular pathway that leads to growth and division and survival and metastasis. There are a lot of different pathways that can lead to all of those things. We can determine which pathway is present in your dog's particular cancer with something referred to as a genetic analysis. This special type of test, which is not the same as a biopsy, can sequence the DNA to determine which mutation or mutations are present, which helps me pick the right targeted therapy for that patient's cancer. Cancer is a very individual disease. That is why it is so difficult to treat. One patient's melanoma does not have the same genetic profile as another patient's melanoma. And that is why sometimes one patient will respond to one drug and the other one won't. This new way of treatment allows us to be more precise with each patient. And like I said, since I've been adding targeted therapy to treatment regimens for dogs with oral melanoma, I've been seeing much longer survival times, which has been pretty cool. Targeted therapy is usually very well tolerated. Most patients do not have negative side effects. People always think about cancer treatment as causing things like a decrease in appetite, a decrease in energy, vomiting, diarrhea. But for the most part, we don't really see that at the doses we use in veterinary medicine. And if one of my patients were to have negative side effects to targeted therapy or chemotherapy or even a supplement, well, I'm going to change the plan. I'm going to give them a holiday from the drug. I'm going to lower the dose. I'm going to try one drug over another if I have to. Maybe I just need to be a little bit more aggressive with supportive care. My point is, is there are a lot of ways to change the plan. And that's what we do to maintain an excellent quality of life while our patients are going through treatment. Now, I mentioned before that I will treat my patients with everything from surgery to broccoli. So what do I mean by that? That means I also address things like diet and supplements and the patient's overall well-being. A lot of my patients are older. They don't just have cancer. They usually have some degree of arthritis or maybe a neurologic problem or they have Cushing's disease. Most veterinary oncologists will take all that into account and address the whole patient, not just the tumor. If you have access to a veterinary oncologist, I encourage you to make an appointment for a consultation. It does not commit you to treatment or one treatment over another, but I think you'll find that information is very valuable to you. Knowledge is power, right? This information will help you make the best decision for you and your family. Now, what if you're one of the millions of Americans who do not have easy access to a veterinary oncologist? How do we help them? Well, for the past year, I've been helping pet parents and general veterinary practitioners from Alaska to Georgia help treat patients with cancer. How do I treat a patient in Georgia with cancer if I live in Washington? If it's okay with the general practitioner, I will chat with the pet parent to discuss what's already been done and what diagnosis has already been determined. I talk to them about what that diagnosis typically means in most patients and what treatments are for most patients. I'll have the medical record, so if I see anything that says a patient shouldn't have one treatment or another, we can talk about that as well. What I can't do through a virtual medium is make the diagnosis myself or prescribe any medications. But what I can do after that consultation, if the family would like me to, and if the general practitioner is willing, I can provide written comprehensive guidelines on how to treat that particular patient. And as the general practitioner implements that plan, wherever they are, if something isn't going right or something unexpected happens, they can contact me and I can walk them through what to do next. I can stay involved in the patient's care for the rest of their life. Now, helping to treat patients all over the country has been super rewarding to me, which is why I'd love to do more of it. If you would like to chat with me, please ask your general veterinarian if that's okay. Again, my name is Dr. Vanessa Rizzo. I'm with Hope Veterinary Oncology Services. 
and we bring veterinary cancer care closer to home.